Kill. This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Tonight with Frank Islam. Today, our guest is Anwar Iqbal. He is the correspondent of the largest newspaper in Pakistan, Daily Dawn. Welcome to our show, Thank Anwar. You, Thank you very much. Thank you. I know you're a journalist, so tell me a little bit about yourself and why journalism, how did you get into journalism? Well, I, mean, I always wanted to write. So I basically started as a writer and then I realized that living in Pakistan, you don't make much money uh, writing Urdu. So I moved started to Started writing in English. Writing in English and of course there, are, there were no magazines in English in Pakistan. We only had newspapers, so I started working for a newspaper. In between, I left it twice. Once I joined the United Nations, worked for them for mm -hmm. some time, then came back, and then I almost joined the armed forces as uh, uh, captain in the inter uh, in ISPR, Inter Services Public Relations, but didn't. So, what do you like about the journalism that energizes you, excited you? And well, I mean, see, it is uh, an interesting profession. In no other profession, you are paid for expressing your opinion. Very well said. You know, in this profession, you're paid for expressing your opinion, and you, and also like the independence it gives you. I mean, yes, there are there are controls, and you have to follow the policies of the newspaper you work for. If you're working for a left-leaning newspaper, you cannot support religious groups. You're working for a religious newspaper, you cannot support the ethnic groups. So those sure. limitations are there. But within those li limitations, there is a, a lot of profession. a lot of room for doing your own. So obviously, the, uh, one of the things journalists do uh, is the freedom of press. Freedom of press is a cornerstone of democracy. And uh, uh, one thing you also do is separate the fact from fiction and separate the truth from the lie. So is that, uh, is that something you're involved in it? I don't know. I mean, like this, there was recently this, this um, a senior journalist from the New York Times. He wrote a very interesting piece about it saying that Basically, I'm, I'm just summarizing it. Basically, his argument was that those who say that they speak, speak the truth and that they do objective reporting and everything, they mislead themselves and mislead others. Because ultimately, journal, journalism is all about influences. I mean, if you do not face direct influence of the government, you do face it. I mean, uh, I mean, first of all, it is a commercial venture. Somebody puts money into it, and obviously that person wants to make money in return, wants profit. And therefore, he is open for influence, opens to be influenced by others. And they do, particularly advise, uh, advertisers and uh, the government and even large uh, private companies. Every group, every person has some influence on somebody, so that is used. And then your seniors influence your opinion and all those things. So what comes out uh, as your final product is not necessarily say, either sort of the whole truth or very objective. It is something in between. <laughs> very, very well said. You're pretty objective in, on your opinion. <clears throat> I want to kind of uh, change the gears and shift the gears, as a matter of fact, uh, the Trump's decision recently to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. What effects will have on the Middle East peace, two-state solutions, and, uh, <coughs> and was it a right move? There are two different things. Right or wrong obviously depends on who is looking at it or the angle you're looking at from. So if you are, say, an evangelist and you believe uh, that the, for the revi revival of Christianity, it is important to have one strong Jewish state, including the entire Palestine and parts of Egypt and parts of Jordan and everything. And unless that happens and Jesus Christ comes back, Christianity will not become the only faith in the world. So if you believe in th those theories, then obviously it is that's, that's what you want. If you are a Jewish person and, and if you are concerned about the welfare of the Jewish people, again, then you want a strong, larger uh, Israel that can stand on its own and face its much larger Arab neighbor. If you are a Muslim, you look at it from a Muslim point of view, which actually takes the same story of Jesus coming back. So because we also believe that Jesus mm -hmm. will come back, 
and but the media turned it around as saying that Jesus will come back and then he instead of Christianity he will bring Islam because Islam is the faith. I mean we believe that Christianity is Islam basically. Islam is not named after Muhammad. It was the same faith that was brought and propagated by this by all the prophets. So that is a religious point of view. Other than that, sec even secular Muslims, uh, left, if you're a left-leaning person in, in the West, say if you support, uh, uh, say, the Labour Party in Britain, or you are, uh, you belong to this, this, other socialist parties in Germany or France, again, uh, you support the Palestinians and the Palestinian mm -hmm. cause and everything. So there is no one objective answer to any questions. It depends on how you look at it. Will it lead to a two-state solution? I think probably everybody talks about it, but nobody except the Palestinians is sincere to two-state solution. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it? Uh, except the Palestinians. I would say not even the Arabs. Why is that? Why does an Arab want it? Arabs are Arab, Arab states. I'm not talking about the Arab people, Arab governments rather. They have their own interest. Basically, uh, they are all involved in a war of their survival because in, uh, in the Arab world, you still have this system where one clan, one family, one group controls the government, controls everything for, uh, for as long as the ruler lives or even after. I mean, you see in Syria, Hafez al-Assad died and he made Bashar al-Assad his uh, successor. And so in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia you have, yeah. that is a monarchy. In Libya, Gaddafi ruled for almost 40 years. And had he lived, he would have obviously brought his son. So same, thing with, same thing with the Bahrain and, Bahrain as well as and all Kuwait. those places. <coughs> so the concept of modern democracy or, you see, why the system? <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> I have asthma a little bit. It happens to me in winter. So in... Uh, In the West, the society has, are strong because the society has changed. I mean, what is governance? Governance is, is basically a group of people controlling the rest of the country or the state or the place in the name of discipline, in the name of peace, in the name of stability. And for throughout history, it is basically it used to be a king or a clan that controlled that. And humanity, humanity had to struggle for like 5,000 years to come to a place where it could say that, hold on, this is not uh, just for one person or one family to decide that that person or that family should share powers with others. And that is how it started, say, in Britain, mm -hmm. where the House of Lords, which was handpicked, mm -hmm. used to control everything, and mm -hmm. House of Commons was just a rubber stamp. Right. And then it turned around, and now House of Commons and everything. So in most Muslim countries, that struggle has not yet reached a stage where the masses could rightfully claim uh, that power belongs to them. And therefore... Blocks the people. Blocks the people. Right. And therefore it is, it is a group of people or it is a family that controls power. And that's why they fail unsafe. And because they fail unsafe, they look for external support. And right now in, the, in that region, they also f face a direct threat all these Arab governments from Iran. And because of that threat, they see the country that could really help them with weapons uh, and with uh, other strategic support that is right. So I think most of these Arab countries do have some sort of, some sort of relationship with Israel. Mm -hmm. So do you think this will impact the fact that some of the terrorist organization, ISIS for example, will encourage them because of this move that Trump has done to recruit more volunteers for their cause? That can happen. That definitely can happen because this is not a very popular move in the Muslim it is, world. I, it also has been very violent in the Palestinian territories as well. Not just the Palestinian I mean, territory. I mean, it, is not, it has not been uh, violent in other places, but uh, if you start from Indonesia all the way to North Africa, is that right? it's, it's, it's a non-popular move among the Muslim masses. It has regenerated uh, or resurfaced uh, a lot of sympathies for, for the, the Palestinians. Palestinians. And 
terrorist groups cash on those things. As they say in Britain, they, they uh, fish in troubled waters. So <laughs> fish in the troubled waters. So that, that, that is how the situation is. And they can go to the people, like I said, look, the entire West is against you, and this is what happens if you're weak. The only way to resist is to fight them. So come join us, pick up weapons, and fight. So, so the violence breeds violence, mm -hmm. and it is quite possible that the violence will continue because of this move. Uh, so it's not a very popular move. Uh, no, it is not. Um, uh, I'm not, uh, I, but, but the Trump, as I understand, said that this is just, uh, he's not moving it yet. Obviously, it takes a lot of money and time and a lot of infrastructure to build a new facility Again, and embassy. politics is, you know, politics is all domestic. Uh, Trump, although it's an international move, but Trump is basically looking at his own vote constituency. Bank, or v own vote bank. Yeah, his own And those who voted for him, I think it is a popular move among them. So he believes that he, he continues to ignore the rest of the United States and the rest of the world. He believes that as long as the people who voted for him are happy, he can get a second term. You know, in America, they say that most presidents do not do, do not make difficult decisions, do not do a lot of constructive work in their first term because they're focused on winning the rest, uh, the second term. And once they get the second term, then they, they, they get about two years to do the works they wanted to do all their lives. And then after two years, they get into the election mode again. So, so uh, uh, stay there, and we'll be right back in a minute. Now it will be your own house, your own house. Your dreams can come true. S.A.I. Mortgage is key for you. Buy your own house and refinance. Do you have to do S.A.I. Mortgage? Don't make a move without S.A.I. Don't make a move without S.A.I. We are back uh, with Anwar Iqbal. So, Anwar, uh, what is the situation with regard to the political thing, climate in Pakistan? That's the number one question. The second one is the relationship between U.S. and Pakistan. Where it is headed? What's going on? Well, um, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship uh, is passing through a very difficult phase. So it is in life support? I wouldn't say that because mm -hmm. they, uh, there is a feeling among, I mean, in Washington and in Islamabad that, that they want to keep that relationship alive. So uh, they, I think the United States does not want to end this relationship. And it's not in their interest. No, and it is not in also in Pakistan's interest. Right. But at the same time, there is one issue that they do not know how to resolve, and that is Afghanistan. Yes. The United States believes there cannot be peace in Afghanistan as long as Afghan Taliban are able to escape. When they come under pressure, they escape to Pakistan. They hide there. And when the situation improves for them a little bit, when the pressure uh, eases up, they go back and they attack again. So they want Pakistan to stop that. <coughs> I, now, there are two things there. I think, number one, personally, I believe that Pakistan does not even have enough strength to stop this phenomenon. It has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Pashtuns have always escaped to this part when they came under pressure from that part and they escaped to uh, the part which is Afghanistan now, when they came under pressure in this part, it happened during the Mughal times, it happened during the British time, it happened before too. Mm -hmm. And because they are the, the same tribes, they're right. related to each other, they re, uh, I mean, there are marriages within, uh, they don't, in, practically they don't even recognize the border. I mean, one brother lives on this side, the other brother lives on that on side. Other, yeah. It's a very difficult, a tricky situation. So, I don't know whether Pakistan can totally stop that. Number one. Number two, Pakistan also has another major concern. It's Pakistan firmly believes, um, this is something, uh, it will take some persuasion and some results in, on the ground to 
uh, force Pakistan to believe otherwise. But Pakistan is believed that whenever India becomes influential in Afghanistan, it uses Afghanistan for creating problems in Balochistan and KP. They have done that in the. What's the KP stands for? Uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Oh, Khyber Pass. Yeah. Uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So they uh, they have done that in the 60s. They have done that in the 70s. They have done that that uh, in the 80s during the Afghan War, and they are doing it now. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, as Afghan Taliban come and take refuge in Pakistan, Pakistani Taliban have crossed the border into Afghanistan and they have established their camps there and they are getting support from uh, the Afghan government and from India. Obviously, they cannot run those camps without support and they launch attacks into Pakistan from those bases, as Afghan Taliban do from bases in Pakistan. Both, uh, I mean, I think uh, both Kabul and Islamabad complain that this is happening and I think both are right. Kabul is right too as well as Islamabad is. And what about the economic cooperation from India rather than getting India engaged <coughs> naturally in Afghanistan? Economic cooperation from India is also linked, yeah, to, flag. linked to Afghanistan. Because basically Indians do want trade, trade relations with Pakistan, but more than that, they want access, land route, through Pakistan to Afghanistan to Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Because the region which is Pakistan now, it has always been a little bit more prosperous than other parts of India mm -hmm. before partition and throughout history, mainly because this has been a passage. You're talking about Silk Route. Silk Route, I mean, the, this, this was a route to China. Correct. Which was the Silk Route, then to the Middle East, mm -hmm. then to Central Asia and all those places. And because of the trade, this, mm -hmm. this part of was prosperous. So in, in a way, Pakistan is also suffering because of that. But unless and until Pakistan's fears in Afghanistan are answered, Pakistan is not going to open that route. And uh, similarly, India has concerns about Kashmir. India believes that Pakistan exploits the situation in Kashmir. And Indians also believe that Kashmir is a part of, an integral part of India. And Pakistan is believed that Kashmir is an, uh, is an unsettled dispute. But that has been going on for 70 years. 70 years. And neither side has made any They're serious. not going to budge. They are not going They cannot. They yeah. cannot. These are both very popular positions in Pakistan and India. Right, I mean, right, Pakistani, right. any Pakistani government that gives up its claim on Kashmir will collapse. And the same thing probably would happen in India. Right. So this is what about the terrorism situation that the, that the India is concerned about also in Pakistan? Terrorism is something that I believe that all regional states mm -hmm. should get together and form a strategy to deal with because terrorism is not in anybody's benefit. So there should be some understanding, some assurance given and taken on all these key issues uh, and they should reach one common conclusion that, yes, these, these disputes will continue. There is no immediate solution to these, these disputes. But in the meanwhile, we should not use violence. And that should include terrorism and other means of violence too. They should give up violence. There should be no terrorism in the region because, see, no other country has suffered more than Pakistan. 62,000 people got killed in Pakistan in the fight against the Taliban. And if Pakistan... So, so they have been the victim of the Taliban's atrocities yes. and violence. Yes. And if these groups continue to operate, I think Pakistan will suffer more than any other country. So it is also in Pakistan's interest to get rid of these uh, terrorist groups. So I am totally <coughs> against using terrorism or ter terrorist groups as a weapon to promote foreign policies or to promote national interests. Nobody's interest is served by using terrorism as a tool. There's no room for terrorism. So we wanted to, so you mentioned, you talked about a, a little bit about the U.S.-Pakistan uh, relationship and also a little bit of India and Pakistan relation. It, it is an interest of Pakistan to have a friend with India. And it is India's interest to make sure that Pakistan is a good neighbor, good friend. So you can promote trade, commerce, investment, and people can have a free flow of information and they can also go from one, you know, they can go from India to Pakistan, Pakistan to India. So where we are headed in that direction, are we um, in anywhere close to working out the arrangement? Unfortunately not, because see, Pakistanis believe that if they push a little harder, they probably can resolve the Kashmir dispute. 
Indians believe that Pakistan is already in a very difficult situation. It's very uh, shaky on a, on shaky, shaky uh, uh, on shaky ground, and therefore, if we push a little harder, it may collapse. Although Indians should realize that a collapsed Pakistan will be more of a danger, more of a threat than to, Pakistan is present. That's uh, a true. Yeah. So I think both uh, governments are not yet making serious efforts to read to the conclusion. The two. To read the conclusion that you have. Uh, <laughs> well, I I would say, uh, Anwar, that's not my conclusion or your conclusion. That uh, that's a common sense that the the promoting the it peace. Is, it is. There is the no other. Al there is no alternative. There is no. no I do not think there is an alternative path to it. Uh, peace is the only thing because. Pakistan, well, see, Pakistan must acknowledge the fact that Pak India is six times bigger, yes. and economically it is now about twelve times bigger, yeah. and it's growing even better, and literally it is much stronger. So Pakistan cannot defeat India, and India should also realize that it cannot wipe out Pakistan. That is, a, that's India a, is a nuclear, uh, Pakistan is, is a, a, nuclear uh, power. a nuclear power, and it will retaliate. And therefore, both countries. So they have to find together. a common ground. The common ground is already there, which is peace yeah, and stability and prosperity for the people. That's but they have to do it. Um, okay. Well, we'll be right back, uh, Anwar, and talk about some other things as well. Abab ka hoga apna ghar, sapna ghar. घर खरीदने और रीफाइनेंस करवाने के लिए एसआई मॉर्गेज से राता करें। Don't make a move without SCI. So we are back with Anwar Iqbal, uh, and uh, we have discussed many topics. Now we want to talk about CPAC. What does CPAC stands for? What is the benefit to China and Pakistan is and to the world communities? China, uh, CPAC is China Pakistan Economic Corridor. Right. And it has great benefits of Pakistan, I believe. See. And also benefit to China. Yes, yeah, obviously, of course. Nobody does anybody a favor unless it also favors benefits you. them. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think what Pakistan needs is investment, not aid. Economic assistance we have been receiving from the United States for the last 70, 60 plus years, and it does not help. Economic assistance does not help any country. The only time it worked was this Marshall Plan in Europe after the Second World War. And that was a very different situation, different kind of involvement, different kind of assistance. And, the, and it, doesn't, it hasn't worked in any third world country. So you're talking about the investment. Investment. That's a sustainable investment, investment that can yield and this is that what, can yield exponential returns. Exactly, that create jobs. Yeah, that those prosperity. Mm, prosperity and everything. So I think this is what Pakistan is believed the CPAC is going to do. Because after all, uh, people say all sorts of things, the Chinese company will own it and they will take all the profits away and everything. But they are creating all those things, building all those things. I mean, they're building power plants in Pakistan. They're building roads in Pakistan. For the first time in cemeteries, um, Americans use the railway line from Karachi to Peshawar to supply the troops in Afghanistan. But nobody said, not even the Pakistani government said that less, I mean, there is only a single track plan since the 19th century. That's true. Nobody suggested they should, they should be, build another track so that you could have faster trains there. Okay? So, um, uh, Pakistan needs this, in, this infrastructure. So, I think so whatever the Pakistan needs a building, they are building, they are building this second track, they are building, they have built a, a network of alternative roads all across the country. And they are building mechanized farms and all this. So it's infrastructure support. It is infrastructure, it's power plants. It's power, and what about energy? It's, uh, it's power plants. They're power plants. And uh, uh, also mechanized agriculture and all those kind of things. And ultimately, those things will stay in Pakistan. And they, when you build infrastructure that brings the society up to a higher level, and no matter who owns them, owns them those, those uh, structures they ultimately help the local people. So I think it is in Pakistan's interest. Uh, so where it is now, and when did it start, when it's going to end, 
and when the people of Pakistan will drive the benefits from it. They have been negotiating it for quite some time, working on it, you know, plans, and others, I think they started uh, when Musharraf was still in power, and then it was, uh, the good thing is that they, all, all government that came since then have pushed it up upwards, so it was carried forward by the PPP government, and then the, the Nawaz Sharif government also did a commendable job in promoting this thing, and uh, I, it, it has reached a state where, a stage where I think uh, we would soon see the benefits for the PPP. So, is it a five-year plan, a ten-year plan? No, it's a, it's a long-term plan. It's a long-term like plan. Yeah, it, is, it's long -term. it is basically, it's not an assistance. Five-year, ten-year plans are, those, are all those assistances. This is like uh, an investment. So you come, you build something and run it mm -hmm. <laughs> with the help of <coughs> obviously local, local companies. It makes a lot of sense. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the Trump's Muslim policies for Muslims in South uh, Asia and especially Pakistan, where we are, where we're headed, and uh, what do we need to do? Trump's policy for Muslims. See, again, I mean, Trump's policy for Muslims or Obama's policies for Muslims or Bush's policies for Muslims will always look after U.S. Their interest, own, their as, own they, interest right. as they should. Right. right. I mean, any American president who does not look after American interest is basically a traitor, has to look after American interest. It is for Muslims. See, there are certain facts in life that you cannot do anything about. Number one, the fact is that America is a superpower. It's an economic superpower, it's a military superpower. So you have to learn to deal with it. And the fact is that you do not live in a tribal or feudal setup anymore. You live in a democratic, post-industrial right. world. And therefore, if you want to benefit from this, you have to build up your human resources, okay? We haven't. And we just complain and we, and then... So what do we need to do? To what we need to do is basically focus on education, focus on Very well training said. people, focus on develop, developing a trained workforce which can compete in modern world. I mean, China has set up a very Become good example. Become a part of the 21st century workforce 21st. so people can drive the benefit, go to school, get education, and get a job. Uh, yes. And help others obviously, to succeed. You're yeah, obviously right. I mean, China is a very good example. Yeah, I think China... China, nobody resists, uh, is, is uh, say, I mean, if I, I don't want to use the word, but that I should, I think. Nobody is more, or more serious serious threat to the West than China is. And China did not do it by going to war or planting bombs or sending terrorists. It's just found one thing, that we have a huge population. And we therefore we can provide cheap labor and in, induce, convince those uh, Western countries to come and build things. Yeah. And they did. And, they did. and they've been very successful. So that, that's, the that's a good example. So why, uh, Anwar, I mean, you, you made a very good point, getting a good education and stay out of the terrorism and building a manufacturing base like a China, we can learn a lesson from them. Why are we, Muslims are not doing that? Because doing that changes your traditional feudal tribal base. Well, Pakistan is not base. a tribal base. It is feudal, it is. It is. <laughs> feudal, feudal mindset we have. I mean, see, if you go to, um, I was, the, 2013, I was sitting at a restaurant in Islamabad. I heard these two bureaucrats, uh, two actually members of the National Assembly talking to each other. I said, well, you know, uh, the, this pre-cell phone days were better. I said, why? I said, well, in those days, you see, people needed telephone connections and they would come with applications to us and we would get them so connections. they will keep his job. Uh, no, <laughs> they will, uh, I mean, you could do favors with them. Oh. And it was a very easy favor to do, get somebody a phone, yeah. and people will feel obliged. So it's like guided obliged. by your own self-interest. Control. Yeah, control, self-interest and control, right. Because what the, the, the cell phones have done is just taken away that control. Now, in Pakistan, so you don't need, it, oh, you, need you need, all you need is a photocopy of, of your national ID card and 100 rupees, and you can you get a connection. Uh, uh, which is wrong. Uh, um, what about the entrepreneurship and uh, creativity, innovation from the young generations in Pakistan? It is there. I mean, see, it's it's there. recently 
one Pakistani gentleman sold his company for what, $4 billion or $6 billion. And there are a lot of much other at a smaller so, level, a so lot of uh, IT companies, a lot of uh, uh, other sort of agriculture based industries. I mean, Pakistan is not, not sort of what it looks mm, from, the, the from, from the outside. The media, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anwar, yes, for uh, talking to us and having a wonderful conversation. And you have given a lot of uh, food for thought. And, uh, Thank you very much for watching. This is Frank Islam wishing you a great week.